I'll give you another example. Um, you know, any kind of history, really. Uh, history is something that is not scientifically proven. There are historical records um, that people think are accurate, but there's no scientific uh, proof that everything that is recorded in history books is necessarily accurate. In fact, a lot of history we know to be inaccurate later. We discover to be inaccurate. Um, this is something that uh, is notorious in a lot of Western history is that um, history can be written in a very biased way. History books can be very manipulative in how they present facts uh, and how they present the historical record. A lot of things are made up when we look at kind of a lot of Western history um, and the history of other cultures. It's something that is not, you know, it's outside of scientific inquiry. There's no way that we can build a time machine and go into the past and empirically study like exactly what happened. We just have to rely on accounts of what has happened from the past. And, uh, you know, in most cases, just trust that what we hear is true. Um, maybe in some cases there's corroborating evidence, you know, and even in Islamic epistemology, we have this idea of Tawethor, that you have um, so many witnesses reporting the same thing that it's impossible um, rationally that they could have all colluded with each other to make up a lie. Um, so maybe for certain events in history, there is that kind of preponderant uh, evidence and, and different testimony all coming together uh, to report a single version of a story. But for the vast majority of what we read in our history classes and college and high school, wherever, it is you know, not at that level of certainty or that level of verification. So you might say, well, none of this is scientific, so how do we know about it? Um, so that's another simple example. But you know, also the, the notion of time. Um, time is something that's very conceptual. It's something that philosophers have been thinking about for uh, thousands of years, for millennia. What is time? And again, it's not something that you can put in, in a Petri dish. It's not something that you can study under a microscope. Um, you might think that we have a notion of time in terms of physics um, and, and other sciences. Like there is a concept of time, but again, that's something that's more conceptual. And time itself, in the terms of like, is time made of anything? Like, is time a material? Um, that's something that people have not agreed upon. It's something that's more metaphysical rather than scientific um, and something that you study in philosophy and not necessarily study in science. Like what is the actual nature of time? Um, so that's these are just examples of things that, again, are not encapsulated by science, but we know that they exist. We all experience time. We all experience our minds, our dreams, you know, what happens in our consciousness. We experience um, history. Like there are things in our personal histories um, that we know to have happened in the past. Like we know them. But it's, again, not something that we can provide scientific proof of. Um, so that's, you know, even think about your own life. Uh, so many things that may have happened to you, there's no necessarily any record of that. All you have are your memories, but memories are just in your head. Uh, how can you prove that to anyone? There's no science that would be relevant in that situation. Um, also, colors. This is a good analogy. Like, again, it has to do with the mind, but we experience colors when we look out into the world. As long as we're not colorblind, we see um, all kinds of reds, blues, greens, and those colors are something that uh, defy the kind of um, explanation, a scientific explanation that we could give someone. And I know that we have a science of light optics. We know that colors have to do with wave, the wavelengths of light and how our eyes work. And sure, that's all scientific. But um, how do you explain, like imagine someone who's colorblind. How do you explain to a colorblind person what color is? Like imagine a person who doesn't have um, any you know, color vision. They see all in black and white or grayscale. How do you explain to such a person what red is? Um, you can explain the wavelengths of light. You can explain optics. You can explain the physics and the science of it. But they're not going to feel uh, and experience what seeing a red actually means. And I think that's a great analogy for um, the idea of explaining how God exists to someone that has no faith in that or has no iman. Um, how can you explain color to someone who's colorblind? It's the same way. When, as Muslims and, and theists generally, we have um, the way that we experience um, God, we experience the ayat, the signs of Allah, the signs of God around us, we experience the world uh, through that lens. We know that we are a creation, that we have a master who has created us, that um, that we are um, uh, part of this bigger picture, and that's how we see the world. That's the, our worldview, that's our paradigm, um, and that's how we speak about ourselves in the world and our relationship to our creator. Um, but if someone doesn't have that, you know, that language, they don't have that experience, um, it's like they're seeing the world in black and white, and it's really hard for someone who sees in color to explain color to such a person. Um, so that's an analogy that I would also use in, in talking about how, you know, the experience of God, how we know that God exists. Um, but the other major assumption that people have, other than this kind of scientific view of knowledge, is that we have to have uh, deductive proof. We have to have a logical proof of God if we are to believe or have reason to believe that God exists. And this is also a mistake. Again, it's it's trying to have this, ve you have this very narrow conception of knowledge um, and how we can know something and you're trying to say oh because god doesn't fit into that narrow definition then it must mean that he doesn't exist but again this is a misconception because there are many things that 
again, we know, we experience, we have very intimate knowledge about. Some of the things that we're most intimately aware of in our lives, our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, you know, the different states within us, and also what we experience outside in the world have nothing to do with logical proof. Uh, so to think that, oh, just because we can't prove God exists through this logical proof, that means must mean that he doesn't exist or that we have no reason to believe he exists. That's why. Why would you think that? It just makes no sense that you would have that expectation. And, you know, this is something that uh, you might say and someone might respond to that by saying that, well, doesn't that mean that you're being irrational, that you're denying logic, um, that you're denying science? And, you know, that's not what we're doing. We're not saying that science is invalid um, or that logic is invalid or that we don't believe in rationality or, or being reasonable uh, or we or we don't believe in logic. That's not what we're saying at all. We're saying that you have a very narrow view of knowledge. You have a very tiny understanding of um, what kind of knowledge there is out there. Um, really, our knowledge can be very expansive. And the way that we know things around us is uh, based on much more than just science and logical proof. Um, so it's invalid. It's incorrect. It's an incorrect assumption to say that only these avenues of knowing or these avenues of knowledge are acceptable and everything else is invalid. Um, so we don't accept that. Uh, our view of rationality is much broader than that. Our view of knowledge is much broader than that. Um, and different thinkers and philosophers um, have noted this and made this distinction uh, throughout history. I'll give you one example from Islamic history and then one example from Western history or Western analytic philosophy. 